wanted to get our keynote in at the, the mid-peak part of the day here, and he's got a great speech, and he is, uh, he is a tremendous writer, a tremendous blogger, and I'm proud to know him. Please help me welcome from Gun Rights Examiner, many, David Codrea. Am I good here? You know, you start writing a speech and it's never done. I've rewritten it three times already this morning. And I just rewrote it again in my mind because I see this gentleman here with the flag. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the expression of liberty. Because look how joyous this man is. That's liberty. I've got a couple housekeeping items that, that I need to get out of the way before I begin the official speech. And the first is to let you know that I brought a case, uh, I smuggled a case in of high capacity magazines. Okay. Unfortunately, I, I don't have enough to share with everyone, but if you come see me afterwards, I've got a few, and, and you have to be force multipliers though, and you have to agree that you'll share them with other people. What I have is I have a copy of Concealed Carry Magazine. This has at the very last uh, page my review of a book by my friends Mark Walters and Rob Pincus, Lessons from Unarmed America. Wonderful book. I gave it total thumbs up. That's my policy. I never give bad reviews because it's not my place to rain on anybody's parade. If I don't like it, I just keep my mouth shut about it. This was a great book. And I'm going to be discussing today's rally tomorrow night on the nationally syndicated Armed American Radio Program with Mark Walters. And I look forward to giving them a wonderful report about how great this crowd is. And the, the other magazine that I brought is Guns Magazine, which I'm the field editor. I do their Rights Watch column every month. And this happens to be the one where I have written about what's going on in Connecticut. And again, I, I wish that I had enough to share with everyone here. I don't. I actually promised these as props to a young man I met up here. I don't see him right now, but I'll give it to him afterwards. There's uh, a bit of sad news that I learned, and that was the passing of Otis McDonald, a giant in Second Amendment. This was the man whose lawsuit in the city of Chicago codified once and for all at the Supreme Court level that the Second Amendment, no, it just doesn't apply to the federal government. It applies everywhere. It's the supreme law of the land, and Chicago has to obey it just as everyone else does. I have a, a personal anecdote about Mr. McDonald. I met him a couple of years ago in Chicago at the Gun Rights Policy Conference that the Second Amendment Foundation puts up. And I told him at the time how honored I was to meet him. And I said, you know what? In my entire life, I've asked two people for their autographs. One, I was 10 years old. And it was Clayton Moore. For those of you who aren't old enough won't remember Clayton Moore. Those of you who do, the Lone Ranger. Okay, my boyhood hero. I met the guy. I got his autograph. Had never asked anyone for an autograph since then until I met Mr. McDonald. And we were standing in the middle of a hotel lobby. There was no real desk to write on. So Alan Corwin of Gun Laws actually graciously lent his back as the writing surface desk and I've got a picture of that and I've got Mr. McDonald's autograph and it's something that I will treasure and it's very very sad news about his passing this was a champion and I, I think that we all just need to take a second in our hearts to remember the passing of a man who did a lot and that we owe a lot that we'll never be able to pay back but we have to just be able to remember him in our hearts with gratitude now one other thing, I noticed that there are some people walking around bearing arms today. And I also noticed that, that some people are, are nervous by that. I don't get it, because to me, it doesn't matter whether you're wearing a firearm or a badge or a uniform or without, okay? It's how the person behaves. So thank you for all who show up and give us the example of bearing arms because it's more than just keep them. I'd like to tell you what an honor it is to 
have been asked to address this gathering today. It, it truly is humbling, okay? And it's humbling to be in front of all of you, and, and in spite of all the insults. I, I've read in the media and some people have called us all some rather uh, insulting names, and that doesn't bother me none. And I'd also ask you, before I get started in earnest, to please bear with me. I am recovering from encounters with my own mortality, so if I have to struggle, struggle with my voice or if I have to take a sip of water, just please bear with me and we will get through this. Okay, when, when Scott Wilson announced my participation a few months back on Facebook, it was pretty funny. He asked people, guess who the guest speaker is going to be? And what he got back was Ted Nugent? <laughs> Tom Selleck? And people kept making guesses, and then finally Scott goes, oh, no, it, it's David Codria. And, and what he got back was, who? <laughs> and, yeah, really. Because it's true. I'm not a name like that. I'm not a rock and roll legend. I'm not a movie or a TV personality. What I am is I'm one of you. And I'm one of you who found his voice. And that voice, first and foremost, has been committed to spreading one message. I will not obey orders for Americans to surrender their arms. I will not obey. That's it. My position is personal, and it couldn't be simpler. You bet it's personal, because I'm the one who will pay the price for what I will and what I won't do. The Yankees, they can debate this all they want. To me, it's not debatable. They can pass whatever edicts they like, and I'll, I'll oppose them, and I'll fight them. Ultimately, my choice is that I'll not obey them. And I'm done backing up and compromising. Yeah! Okay? It may seem funny asking some guy from Ohio, you know, I, I heard they were asking who's here from the various states, and I'm here from Ohio. And it may seem funny asking me to come and address a rally in Connecticut. Uh, I would like to share, I do have a connection. The part of the state I live in is called the Western Reserve. And that was once a portion of land claimed by the colony of and later by the state of Connecticut. And as a matter of fact, my neighborhood in Hudson is called the Connecticut Colony. And the entire area is rich in history, including in the struggle against human slavery, which is really what those claiming the power to control you and dispose of you is all about. I live just around the corner from John Brown's old tannery farm, and say what you will about the man's tactics and his legacy, it does show that some conditions demand defiance if no other means exist. And that, of course, was the situation that led to the original War of the Rebellion against the king. People would not put up with what they came to view as the intolerable acts. Oh, they did for a while, until the damn fools came for the guns. Note that I did not call it the Revolutionary War, because the true revolution was ideological. The realization that free men don't need rulers, that the function of government is to secure the blessings of liberty, and that we, each of us, have certain unalienable rights endowed by our Creator, rights which cannot be legitimately taken away from us by a tyranny of the majority, as now exists in some areas that identify themselves by that most Orwellian of terms, progressive. And you know, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. I have a saying I use on my blog, the War on Guns Notes from the Resistance, that I've yet to see refuted. With progressives, every day is opposite day. Because what's progressive about telling others who are harming no one what they must and must not do and what they can and cannot have. What's progressive about creating a whole new class of criminals, and I have that word in quotation marks, for refusing to obey edicts founded in ignorance, prejudice, and the desire to rule others. I wrote an article for Guns Magazine recently, that's, that's the one in this issue here, in the Rights Watch column, and I titled it The Unconstitutional State. It's obviously a play on Connecticut's nickname. It started out referring to a line that you folks here are more than familiar with, 
the one in front of the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection building, where gun owners came on the last day of 2013 to register their guns and magazines with the DESS Parados in order to comply with the perversely named Gun Violence Prevention and Child Safety Act. Making them do that, that was an intentional indignity and that such legislation would do nothing to advance its stated purpose and would instead make things less safe for the law abiding, that did not matter to those imposing their will. That was just another oxymoron that calculating minds right here in Hartford no doubt took additional pleasure in. Progressive, opposite day, remember? The vocal reaction now, this is, this is the thing, you know, we've talked about the gun owners from other states and you folks experienced the brunt of it. And it actually horrified me because some of them was unsympathetic. They did not have to face the terrible choice that you do here. And there were accusations. There were people throwing around words like cowardice. And this was coming from internet commentators post posting under screen names. And isn't that telling? And that making such charges had never, they, they'd never been put to the test themselves, and that seemed lost on the most aggressive, that is the most ignorant and the judgmental among them. And as an aside, I'd like to share something with you. That even though I'm an outsider, I can tell you that I know what it's like to be put to that test. Because I was living in California when they passed a law requiring us to register our assault weapons, okay? And I went to a meeting where the California Department of Justice distributed the registration cards they told us that we had to fill out, and they used the keyword submit. That is, basically, it was a meeting where they dictated to us the terms of our surrender. Okay, well, I went with two of my friends, the fellow troublemakers, and in front of hundreds, we tore up the damn card and told them in no uncertain terms that would be the only one they got from us. Now, we, we did it. We did it knowing full well we were putting ourselves out there for scrutiny and more. And I'll never forget this one woman, and I promised my wife, I had this written into the speech. She goes, oh please, in front of all these people, don't call her a cut chewer, so, okay honey, I won't. Okay. But she, she calls out, sir, they don't speak for us. And I thought, you know, yeah, I sure don't, lady. Remember, I told you at the beginning, I speak only for me. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about that, if you do a search on my name along with the professional face of evil, uh, you'll get the details on that little encounter if you're interested in learning more. But it struck me then, it strikes me now, it's a hell of a choice to force a person to make. But back to some of these finger pointers who, who don't understand, who haven't been put to the test, if one is to be laying blame on anyone outside of the evil citizen disarmament demanders, and, and what a word that is that the Bloomberg people use, and their useful idiot enablers, many gun owners would do well to look at the direction of three of their fingers whenever they point one at others. Because after all, how many of them have filled out Form 4473s or applied for permits to carry their guns? And truthfully, in, in light of shall not be infringed, those are acts of, of compromise and surrender. It just, it just, it is. So for them to be pointing the finger at you is absolutely wrong. 